Psalm 121. A few years ago, my uh, homeowner's insurance company reached out to me and said that they were going to uh, drop me from coverage if I did not clean off the moss from my roof. And uh, moss had developed over time uh, because of the shade and whatever. So uh, I did what I thought I should do, and I started looking into companies that clean off moss. And when I started doing that, I realized I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to do it myself. And so uh, sure enough, I went up to, uh, climbed up my roof and started with a broom, just and doing the job, right? Let's all hear that noise together. Good job, right? And so I cleaned off my roof, and um, uh, took me took me a few hours. I did it over a couple days. I, I made the mistake at one point to do it, uh, thinking uh, that early in the morning would be best, but that also was time when like the sun was hitting me the most, and so I'm like, I'm getting a little dizzy from the sun and things like that, and so. Um, I said, I'm going to leave it for a cooler day. And so uh, the last day that I had to finish this one section of my roof, I did it very early in the morning before the heat of the day. I climbed up to the back side of the roof. And, and, and what happened was as I got to the top rung of the ladder and put my leg over to uh, the roof, something happened that had not happened the other times before I had climbed up. When I stepped onto my roof, suddenly my heart was filled with fear. And I was like, huh, that's different than I felt these other times. And I got to the uh, roof, and I'm out there by myself, right? These are all just really wise moves, right? Do it in the sun. Do it by yourself. Don't do it with a professional. Don't, this isn't one of the things you want to follow my example in church, okay? And so I get to the top of the roof, and I am just suddenly overwhelmed with fear. I'm sitting down on the roof. I don't broom it at all. I'm just locked and, and totally shut down by fear and anxiety. I do not think I'm going to be able to get down. The hardest part of navigating the roof is, is getting down, like with that, with that first step off the roof, down to the first rung, right? And um, I just didn't think I could do it. The ladder was moving. Just, I just couldn't do it. So what I did was I sat there um, for a while on the roof. I sat down on the roof and um, I waited for one of my kids to come out. And uh, when one of my children came out, I think it was, um, I don't remember, Eden or Esther, and I said, hey, can you please tell mom that I need her help with something? But please tell her that I don't want her to come out until she is done with all the things she needs to do to get ready so that she is peaceful and, and calm. Because my wife is getting ready to go teach and bring the kids to school, and she's frantic, and it's, it's, it's the morning time, and it's crazy. And I know that if my wife comes out there scattered and frantic, she goes, what? I'm going to be even more scattered and frantic. So I said, you know what? I'm not going anywhere. I'll just sit down and wait for her to come out. So she comes out. She gets on. She, she was, it was wonderful. She climbs up the ladder, and she says, you can do it. You can come down. And I said, I, I know, I just wanted to see if you were going to come help me. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said, all right, I know. I just, could you just hold the ladder for me? And, you know, and, and she was very peaceful and calm and helped walk me down. And the end of the story is I got off the roof. If you were wondering what happened, I'm not still on the roof. I don't know why, but like in that moment, I like suddenly became afraid of heights. One of, one of the kindest things my friend Dan ever did for me was after I told him I was scared to climb back up on the roof, he came over one day on a Saturday with his big tall ladders and he went up there and finished clearing off the moss for me on my house. Isn't that awesome? And, and what was so cool about that was while he was climbing up, this was a couple weeks later, he said he was like jumping on the ladder as he went. And he was like, look, it's safe. It's safe. You can do it. And so he went up to the ladder and said, do you want to come? And I said, no. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, being on that roof for that little time, I felt so helpless. If my family was not home, my neighbors would have heard someone going, hello. <laughs> but be sure, I would have waited until my wife had left. 
because ain't no fire truck coming to my house <laughs> with a fireman holding me on his shoulder when my wife is home. <laughs> Our question this morning is, where does your help come from? And that brings us to Psalm 121. You'll notice in the text, there's a heading, a song of ascents. You see that? A song of ascents. Uh, Psalm 120 uh, to Psalm 134 are what are known as the Psalms of Ascent. And there are 15 Psalms of Ascent, and these are some of my favorite Psalms in all of the Scripture. And they're called the Psalms of Ascent because these were the songs or the Psalms that the pilgrims that would have traveled to Jerusalem at least three times a year would have sung as they made their way to Jerusalem. Anytime you travel to Jerusalem, you would say, I am going up to Jerusalem. Even if you live somewhere that is at a higher elevation, by the time you get to Jerusalem, Jerusalem is on a mountaintop and you go up to Jerusalem. So these Psalms of Ascent, Ascent means to go up, right? And so these Psalms would have been the songs that you would have sung as you made your way up to Jerusalem. And as you read them, these 15 Psalms, you can kind of see that the psalmist starts very far away and gets closer and closer. Halfway through, they say, I see your gates. As it gets closer, is how wonderful it is for the brothers to dwell together in, in unity. How wonderful it is that the walls of Jerusalem are strong and secure. So you, you start far away, you get closer, and you get closer. And so here we're early on in the Psalms of Ascent, verse, uh, or Psalm 121. And the psalmist writes this, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? So the first part of the song as this pilgrim travels to and from Jerusalem is they lift up their eyes to the mountains and ask, where shall my what come? Where shall my help come? And so the, the pilgrim is asking, how am I going to make this journey? Uh, one scholar writes this about the journey uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, one who began, one who began the 15-mile ascent from Jericho, say they lived in Jericho to Jerusalem, it was an ascent of over 3,000 feet. Climb, they climbed a steep path over a sun-drenched, treeless terrain of gorges and ravines. Moreover, there were wild animals and thugs to fear. So the roads that took you through the wilderness and through the mountains and through the valleys to get to Jerusalem were not nicely paved roads with rest stops. They were rough terrain. Animals and wild beasts lived there, and criminals were known to uh, take advantage of travelers. In fact, you know from Jesus, when he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, he starts it like this. Jesus replied and said in Luke 10, 30, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst what? robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead so this man is leaving jerusalem and he gets jumped and so the the travel to and from jerusalem would have been difficult and so we don't know exactly where this person is along their journey maybe they are starting the journey from a faraway place and as they make their way out they look at the mountains and they are aware of the looming journey before them the unknowns and the mountains represent the hard and difficult parts of this journey. Maybe the traveler is in the middle of the journey singing this song. I will lift my eyes to the mountains from where shall my help come? And as they travel in uh, this ancient uh, place, oftentimes the pagans would worship their gods on top of the mountains. Many times in the Old Testament, the people of God are told to tear down the high places of the idols and the high places of the false gods. You see, pagans would build their altars to their idols on top of mountains, thinking that they were closer to their gods and maybe they would earn their God's favor. And so sometimes when you think of the mountains, looking to the mountains, it's representative of the other options that the travelers had. To trust in Baal or to trust in Asherah, to trust in the powers of this world to take care of them. And so they're traveling on this journey which may be treacherous and long and unknowns await them and they look up. Does my help come from the mountains, they ask? Or perhaps this traveler is leaving Jerusalem, leaving the safety of the city, looking at the mountains that surround 
Mount Zion. And as they leave, they look at the world and the life that awaits them away from God's people. And they ask, as they lift up their eyes to the mountains, from where shall my help come from? This pilgrim is actually asking a question. This person is aware of the difficulties of this journey, and they're asking, where am I going to get help for this journey? And this word help doesn't mean just lend a hand, right? Hey, do you need help carrying in those packages? Sure, thank you. That's not what this word means. This is the Hebrew word, ezer. Let me hear you say, ezer. I needed ezer when I was on the roof. The first time this word is used is in Genesis 2, when every creature had a companion except Adam. He was alone, and God said, I will make you help in Eve. Here are some other usages of this word, Ezer. In Exodus 18, Moses had two sons. The second son was named Eliezer. For he said, the God of my father was my what? Help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Moses, knowing he had been delivered from Pharaoh, named his son with a word rooted in this word help. His life was saved. That's the kind of help we're talking about. In Deuteronomy 33, 26, there is none like the God of Israel who rides the heavens to your what? To your help and through the skies in his majesty. God is personified as this mighty warrior riding on the clouds to bring help. Not just like suggestions right? Hey, lefty loosey, righty tidy. No, no, no. We're talking about help in the midst of the battle. And in Psalm 70, verse 5, the Christian Standard Bible says, I am afflicted and needy. Hurry to me, God. You are my what? My help and my deliverer, Lord. Do not delay. The pilgrim on this journey, as he's thinking about what lies before him, he says, where am I going to find help for this journey? And this journey and these psalms are not just about traveling to and from Jerusalem, but they serve as a metaphor for the journey of life. And as we navigate life, navigate the twists and turns of life, we all need to ask this question, where does my help come from? Now, that implies that you recognize you need help. You don't ask for help if you don't need help. But all of us, at some point in our lives, are going to recognize that we cannot help ourselves. That we do not have what it takes within us to help ourselves in the long run. And so when we find that we cannot help ourselves, we begin to look outward and, and look outside of ourselves for help. And we, we find that all of the options out there fail us to really give us the help we need. The government, churches, schools, the media, the authorities, and even our sports teams fail us. You know why? Because humans fail us. Humans lie to us. Humans let us down. We look to relationships for help, to fulfill us. We look to our spouses. We look to our jobs. We look to our children to help us feel better, to get us through. We look even times to our pets or our resources. And yet, so often they fail us. And then maybe we look to other things. We look to alcohol to help us get through. We look to marijuana to take the edge off. We look to medication to make the pain go away. We look to food for at least a few moments or hours of goodness. We look to experiences. We look to vacations and then come home only needing another vacation. And then we look to shopping and all the rest, looking to these things to help us make it through this life. But yet, all of those things fail us at some time and in the end. And so we walk through this life 
and arrive at places which are daunting and difficult, which reveal to us our lack of control, our lack of power, our lack of strength. It might be you stepping over a ladder and onto the roof. It might be you moving onto a street. It might, you, it might be you getting called into your employer's office. It might be the phone number uh, of the doctor's office showing up on your caller ID. It might be when you log into your bank account and realize that it's all gone. It might be when you wake up in the morning and can barely get out of bed. It might be in the middle of the night when you're longing for the morning because the nights are long with you being awake. And we realize that in ourselves and in this world, we don't find help. And so I ask you, where does your help come from? Well, Psalm 121 verse 2 tells us the best and only source. Verse 1 says, I will lift my eyes to the mountains from where does my help come? Verse 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. My help comes from whom? The Lord. And then the defining characteristic of the Lord in this chapter or in this verse is he made heaven and earth. I love that. Because if you were looking to the mountains to make you feel safe and secure, and then you finish the mountain part of the journey and are in the valley and start freaking out, it says that he made heaven and earth. If you're in the valley worried about what awaits you in the mountains, and so your comfort level starts to fade as you journey on, you realize that if your help comes from the Lord, he made heaven and earth. He made the mountains. He made the valleys. He exists in the mountains. He exists in the valleys. He's faithful in the mountains. He's faithful in the valleys. And everywhere in between, you know why? Because he made it. He made heaven and earth. I look to the mountains. Where does my help come from? Does it come from the mountains? Does it come from the false gods of this world that offer protection and help but fail us? Do the mountains scare me and I lack help? Well, if that's true, he says, my help comes from the Lord. My help comes from Yahweh, the creator and maker of heaven and earth itself. And if he is the maker of heaven and earth, then he exists in all of the every inches of that creation, heaven and earth. You see, he's not just confined to the temple. He's not just confined to the sanctuary. He's not just confined to the church. He's not just confined when you're with other people who know him and fear him. He's not just confined to the battles or the day of peace. He made heaven and earth. So anywhere you go, he's there. Anything you face, he's there. Anything you need, he's there. Anywhere you go, the helper the Lord himself is there. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so the next verses three and four, he will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. So... The psalmist says that his help comes from the Lord, but then we wonder, well, can we trust him? And here is what uh, scripture says about this God who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel doesn't slumber or sleep. So why look to the Lord for help? Because if you do, you won't slip because he doesn't sleep. Now, this word slip doesn't just mean get tripped up, okay? I was worried about slipping when I was on the roof. Had I slipped, there would have been cause for concern. Unless you serve the God of Bobby Les Carbo. Bob fell off a roof this week. Totally didn't think about that till just now. This might be triggering you and I apologize. And he was in the hospital and bleeding and here he is sitting here because we have a faithful God. He said he's fine. I'm fine, he told me this morning. I'm totally fine. He fell off a roof like four days ago and he's here at church. God is good. Let's just talk about <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Of all the days to tell the roof story, Bobby, thank you. I'm sorry. 
This word slip doesn't just mean get tripped up. It means fall and fall to your destruction. Okay? And the reason why that's important to understand, because if you just think slip, like, ooh, ooh, almost slipped. Then when you are living for God in this world and slip up or have difficulty, you might think the Bible just lied. But the Bible never promises that God's people go through life without oops or difficulty. Every single one of the great men and women of faith in the Bible and since the Bible was written have had difficulties. Every single one of the heroes and heroines of faith have had challenges. Joseph got thrown into a pit and sold into slavery and into jail and he was forgotten. Moses was expelled from Egypt for 40 years wandering in the wilderness. David was betrayed by his own sons and his own family and was on the run from King Saul. Paul in prison, beaten and stoned. See, this verse doesn't mean that the people of God won't go through difficulty, but what it does tell us is if the Lord is your help, the difficulties that you experience in your life will not lead to your destruction, nor will you be abandoned in the end, because if the Lord is your help, your foot will not slip. So when you're in the difficulty, you can believe this promise that even though I'm going through difficulty right now in this journey with rough terrain, with darkness, with uncertainty, I know that in the end, God's going to work it all out because he promises that he will not let his people be destroyed. If the Lord is your help, you won't be destroyed no matter what is happening along the journey. And the reason why is because he doesn't slumber or sleep. God never gets tired. God never runs out of strength. God never needs a nap. God never gets groggy. Humans get groggy and tired. I've seen some of you fall asleep during church. <laughs> There's been times when my sermons have been so bad I've fallen asleep. <laughs> God is awake and alert and on the job at all times. He doesn't get tired or groggy or slumber or sleep. My wife is a very light sleeper. If my wife gets woken up, she has a very hard time going back to sleep, right? So if, if, if there's a problem or there's a noise or my kids don't feel good in the middle of the night or have a bad dream, uh, she could be woken up and she wants to care for them, but she's going to have a hard time falling back asleep. I do not have that problem. And so we've worked it out right now with our kids who are a little older. If there's a problem at night, they come and talk to dad. The problem is, I am a very sound sleeper. And so they have to balance these two things out. Don't wake up mom, but wake up dad somehow. And so we have very um, wonderful legacy stories in my house about my children coming in to wake me up and me telling them after they say, dad, I had a bad dream or dad, I had a sore throat. All right, just go outside and get some fresh air. <laughs> or so I've been told. <laughs> My children are talking to me, but I'm not all there because I'm, I'm slumbering. We've had to make a new protocol where they like make sure I'm awake. Social security number needs to be recited and all those different things <laughs> to make sure that I'm awake. Your God is never like that. Your God is not like that. Anytime one of his children cries out to him, he's on it. He's awake. He's alert. 
In fact, he knows what you need before you ask. You come into his room, so to speak, hypothetically, and cry out to him. He's already on it. He's already working it out. I know you're not feeling well. I know you're nervous. I know you're scared. I am your help. I made heaven and earth. I don't sleep or slumber. And so your foot, your life will not slip. You won't fall. You won't be destroyed. He doesn't sleep or slumber. How beautiful is that promise? He's never weak or tired. The, the pagans have to jump up and down to hope to get their God's attention because they are not gods at all. But God is always awake and always alert. Humans fall asleep. Heroes die. Supplies run out. But the Lord has, Yahweh has no weaknesses. So where is your help? Who are you looking to for help? My help is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, who will not let my foot slip. He doesn't sleep or slumber, but he's always alert. Verse 5 and 6, the Lord, Yahweh is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. And what these verses tell the pilgrims and tell us is that no matter the time or the season, the Lord can be trusted. He says that he will keep you during the day, he will keep you at night, right? Things that you can see on the horizon because it's daylight, he can take care of you in those things. Things that you can't see because it's dark, he can take care of those things. Darkness is not dark to him. The sun will not destroy you. The moon will not torment you. When the heat is on, your help comes from the Lord. And even when you're left alone in your thoughts, do you know where the word lunatic comes from? It comes from the moon. It comes from the word meaning moon because sometimes crazy things happen at night. And sometimes crazy thoughts happen at night. And sometimes the, the night is the, the worst time of all. You're laying in bed and everything in your brain comes alive. And you start thinking and worrying and falling asleep and waking up and falling asleep and waking up and trying to figure out how can I get this out of my mind. For many of us and for some times in our life, we dread when it becomes night. All the things that we trust, they go home. All the busyness slows down and we are left alone in our bed. And this scripture here tells us that whether it's daytime or nighttime, the Lord is our keeper. The Lord is our help. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. We don't know what's going to happen for better or for worse, but our help comes from the Lord. Where are you getting your help? Who is your help? What are you trusting in? What are you waiting on? What are you looking towards? Who are you hoping in? I have the Lord as my help. He is the maker of heaven and earth. Trusting him ensures that our feet will not slip. He will keep us day or night. He is faithful. He doesn't sleep. And the psalm ends in verse 7 and 8. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Oh, man. I need to read that again. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul the Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. A.K.A. God's got this. Anywhere you go, the psalmist has told us, God is with you. Any time of day, the psalmist has told us, God is with us. Anything we need, God is with us. Whether they're starting the journey, on the journey, finishing the journey, the Lord will guard you now and forever. Our help comes from the Lord. 
And there's a really important word in verse 7, and it's the word soul. Six times in this psalm, the word keep is used. Keep and guard, all the, that's all the same word. Here, the psalmist says that the Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. And the reason why I wanted to highlight that word is because that reminds us really about the, the real journey that we're on. This psalm is not just about making it from point A to point B. This isn't just about a mixtape in the car while you're traveling with the kids to the destination to make the time go by faster. These are prayers and promises which God's people need to keep in their heart. And what the psalmist concludes with is this reminder that the Lord, yes, he will help us on the journey. Yes, he's with us wherever he goes. But his ultimate desire and goal is to keep our soul. Because the most important journey that really we're all on is here and now heading towards eternity. Heading towards God's kingdom. And that's what I really want his help with. That's what I ultimately need him to guard me in. When I confessed Jesus as my Lord, I started to follow him. And I started on a path and a journey that was in a very different direction than the way I used to go. That's called repentance. I turned away from marching towards death and I turned following Jesus' lead and the path that he set before us to the kingdom of God, to the celestial city, to the new Jerusalem, right? And, and when I'm walking that journey, there have been so many times when I've slowed down. There have been so many times when I've run into obstacles. Yep. Bill Sant perfectly <laughs> timed right here, or maybe run into me. There have been times when I've tried to take a shortcut, but really it was a trap. There have been times when I've been stuck in the mud. There have been times when I've sat down on a bench and haven't followed the progress of the journey that I've needed. There have been times when people have come along the road and distracted me or tricked me. There's been other times when people have walked with me and it's been an encouragement and it's helped my step move faster. Here's what I want. Whatever is happening in this journey that I'm on, I want God to keep me on the path so that I can end up in his kingdom, so that I can end up seeing his face. I want him to keep my soul. That is my ultimate desire. God, keep our souls. You know the path we should be on. You know what we can handle and what we can't handle. You know what our enemies are. You know what's going to trip us up. Keep us, Lord. I don't know what's good for me. But I know who is and I know who does. The Lord is is my helper, the maker of heaven and earth. He's with me everywhere I go. He's with me in every season. Even though you have difficulty in your life, he is faithful. Even when you're not faithful, he is. Amen? Amen. He's good in the light. He's good in the dark. He's your provider in times of abundance. He will sustain you in the times that are lean. The Lord is our helper, the maker of heaven and earth, and he will guard us and keep our soul from now until forever. If my help comes from anything other than him, when those things are shaken, I'll be. But because he can't be shaken, I'm going to be okay. Now, I want you to notice one more thing before we finish. I want you to notice as you look at the text in your Bible, in verse 1, this isn't going to be on the screen. You've got to look at the whole thing. He says in verse 1, what's that first word? I. <laughs> Did everybody hear what Leo said? What's the first word? I. Say it again, Leo. What's the first word? I. I. See that? Do you see that? I will lift up whose eyes? Follow along. I will lift up whose eyes? I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall whose help come? 
My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The psalmist is speaking in a way that indicates that they are talking to their, their own heart, my help, looking for help for themselves. And then something shifts in verse 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Instead of it being my and, and, and talking about to themselves, he now starts talking to someone else. You see that? Where is my help going to come from? And then he says, verse 3, he will not allow your foot to slip. You see that? He who keeps you will not slumber. Verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep whose soul? Your soul. Now, it's possible that uh, this is a man who's singing this song as he travels, and he's singing it to himself, and then he sings it to his family. It's possible that it's the worship leader getting the congregation uh, to sing along at just the right point. He starts with the solo and then starts singing to them to encourage them to trust God. But you know what else it could be? What else it could be is that uh, this person who is on this journey that is aware that they need help, realizes that they need help, realizes that the Lord is the only one they can go to for help, and so they start telling themselves where their help is found. And this might be what we need to do today. Because I just told you how great the Lord is, but you know who needs to believe that the Lord is great? You do. You need to not just get all hyped because of my enthusiasm this morning. You need to believe and experientially embrace that the Lord is for you, not against you, and that he is your help. And so you might need to just tell yourself that this morning. Hey, Marcy. Yes? <laughs> Trust in the Lord. He is your help. Okay. Marcy, the Lord is your help. Thank you, Marcy. I believe that. The Lord will protect you. Yes, he will. Thank you. Right? Maurice needs to say to himself, hey, Maurice. Yes. <laughs> trust in the Lord. He can provide for you. And Maurice goes, you saying I should trust the Lord? He says, yes. The Lord is your help. The Lord is my help? Yes, the Lord is my help. If you just hear this and read this and memorize this, it's not going to help you. You need to believe this in your soul, and you might believe this in your soul if you tell yourself to trust in him. You look up to this world, you look up to the mountains, you look up to all the options. Is that where your help comes from? No, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And though the mountains move and shake, he is faithful every day, day or night. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. You better tell yourself that today. You better convince yourself of that today. You better speak to your own heart those truths today so that tonight when you're laying down and the darkness starts to come, you can say the Lord is my helper. Not just his, mine. And for the first time in this sermon, I am going to reference the election. The Lord is our helper. On Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday. This has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with your life and your journey and what really matters in the world. We look to the mountains. Is that where our help comes from? No, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Amen. Amen. Father, blessed be your name. You are the same faithful God that we read about in this ancient song and this ancient poem. As we travel on our journey to your great city, be our help. Be the helper and keeper of our souls. Be the helper and keeper of our hearts. Be the helper and keeper of our thoughts, of our bodies, of our families. 
Who else would we trust? Everything else has failed, but you never have. We are so grateful that this morning we know that Jesus is the King. And Father, you are God over all, forever and ever and ever. Blessed, faithful, worthy of our worship and adoration. Oh, what a privilege to be your son. What a privilege to be your daughter. What a privilege to know you and be your people. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.